is going on, everybody? Bobby Five with my guys, Jake Rohde and Eric Sheets Haber. Reminder, please like the video and check out TrueDFS.com. We've made a lot of improvements, a lot of changes, and we have now partnered with SaberSim, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And you can literally get our package for, uh, you know, a small amount more than theirs and, and, and have both sides of it. Have all of our picks, have all of our plays, have Sheets' projections, have Rohde's picks. And you can have them both together now for a very small cost, which is obviously on our site. Anyway, we're going to get into some MLB baseball, talk about sort of some basic strategy, things that we're going to utilize coming in this upcoming season, which thankfully we have. Yes. Um, and we're going to talk just like overall from a tournament perspective, cash game plays. I'll talk about every day because it's very obvious the cash game plays in tournaments. I'm sorry, in, uh, in regular DFS. But tournaments are a different story. And let's talk about projection sheets because that's the first place to start this thing off. Cause a lot of people do use projections. You guys do a little bit more than I do. I use them as a baseline of information and seeing what people will do and trends, but it's different for every sport. And in baseball, the, the, the safest things are NBA projections, which sounds crazy to say out loud, but it's NBA projections and pitchers in, in DFS sports. We know that a quarterback might throw for 300 yards, only have two touchdowns and end up as the 11th quarterback of the week. We know that they're, that these pitchers, while they may not end up great, when you look at the end of the season, the guy's 20 and three with a 2.1 ERA and uh, strikes out, you know, 10.5 per nine innings. That's a, these are guys who were playing for a reason. So projections for me mean a lot in baseball as it comes to pitching. It's the question is whether you trust the projections sometimes, but talk a little bit about how projections affect your play and uh, MLB strategy. Well, you hit the nail right on the head and you got you, I had a much more dramatic way of saying what you said. Um, well, so let's just start with that. Is that, is that, all sports and DFS are different. That's one of the reasons why I like, I like this as a hobby is to be able to approach different sports differently. And that's why I like to play different sports and the impact or the importance of projections really is, is sport dependent. And as Bobby mentioned perfectly, you know, basketball is very projectable. Football is kind of in the middle. Hockey is very, very difficult to project. And with respect to baseball, it's really interesting because as he was saying, part of it, is very projectable and part of it is just not you know when you, you take hitting for example you could put a median or a mean projection out there yet the fact of the matter is the way results distribute does not center around that median like basketball you get like these basketball players that that project for 45 median and they'll get 42 43 49 51 52 50, whatever with a couple of outliers but with baseball when you get a median or a mean of say like 15 of like of a hitter you're going to get like zero, 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 40, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and that, and, and, and they use the example. I think that the 18% of the time, like Mike Trout goes over four, you know what I mean? Like, I right. mean, you think about that, you know? So, so, so with respect to baseball, it's interesting because you, those the projections can help guide you to pitching pretty easily, but with, the hitting, you got to have much more of a, uh, of a thick skin. You know, you got to have more, more vision and, and you really have to accept the variance of, of what hitting does. And, and not only that, but, you know, which teams you play, which types of hitters that you play are, is really, really important. Like two hitters with identical medians could have totally different distributions of, 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 of ranges. So, Look, it's the same as any other sport. I'm going to start with my, with projections to upload and to optimize and do whatever. Listen, I got to start somewhere. But in the end, I mean, if you play like, you know, top median projected lineups like in baseball, you're just really not doing yourself any favors, you know, especially if they're going to be going to be highly owned. So so look, we're going to put our projections up. We'll have Sabres and projections up. We have all kinds of projections up. But the fact of the matter is, is that is that the predictability of the projections is not it's not that great and it's not as important as other sports, but with pitching, it certainly is. Right. That's so that's exactly. And you use the, the, the greatest example in this is that Mike Trout, the do it all player, I would say Ronald Acuna, because I would just imagine that overall he's got probably a higher projection going forward than Mike Trout does. Um, but you take a guy like that and it doesn't, even if they got the guy gets you, like say he's projected for 12 fantasy points and nobody else is projected for 10 on the slate. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, you have two ways to get there with the, the home run and the stolen base upside. And I'll get into that in a minute because I want to talk about types of guys that I focus on. But let's talk to Rody a little bit about that in terms of stacks. Like, I know you won a bunch of big tournaments, one big one with the Dodgers, which you could just make an argue 
or an argument that the Dodgers last year, the Dodgers this year, uh, the Blue Jays, if you played 10% of these teams every night, regardless of the pitching, the, the pitcher that was opposing them, regardless of how good the bullpen is, that if you played 100 lineups and you played 10% of these guys and just mixed it around with that 10% every night, you're probably going to win some tournaments. I know it sounds like a re- weird thing and it's not a great general strategy to have, but it really is true. And Rody, you won it on some of the nights where there was things were against these guys. You know what I mean? I, th- I think it was the, I got it right, right? The Dodger one? Yeah, the Dodger one was a one three K contest I won. Toronto yeah. was another one with like a Houston stack. So, a, a lot of those guys I was stacking like a lot of those big hitters. You know, like you, and you also Gorel, you know, was a seventh hitter a lot of times for Toronto. That's right. But like we don't need to grab the top hitters all the time. Like right. he he could just hit three homers himself right. in a game, and he'll be the seventh hitter at three percent owned, and you're ahead of the field. So I. I I do use like top stacks. And when I talk about top stacks, I'll probably give out some value stacks. I'll probably give out some like low own stacks or some upside. I use the projections a lot too, because a lot of the projections will factor in like park upgrades. They factor in a lot of the weather. Some of these bigger projection models that we're using factor in so many things that you get a good projection on guys and you'll still be able to get, use the projections some. So don't just not throw them out the window. But like I'll use them for that. I'll build my stacks around these good projections, these good parks, these ceiling type hitters that we want. Like you know, big you know, homer hitters, good in game environments they're in, and that's kind of how I build my stacks a little bit and get these. And ownership is a big one. I use projections for that. Include our projections include the ownership. So huge, huge thing right there. Just have the ownership. Absolutely. And then some basics like, look, I did win a tournament like this one. So, but this does shouldn't happen. And it was on a full slate. I accidentally had something wrong with an out when one of the rare times that I, that I scripted everything and I won a big tournament and I had Mike Trout in the same lineup as the opposing opposing pitcher, which was Dylan Bundy when he pitched for the, the Orioles, Mike Trout had a home run and two stolen bases and a walk. Uh, I'm sorry, home run, two stolen bases, two walks. Uh, the team was one hit. <laughs> Dylan Buddy struck out 15 guys. That is not a normal expected result. You shouldn't be playing hitters against your own pitcher on, on two to five game slates. You should, um, you should have to look at that, but in general, you just, I, I'm sure you guys are in agreement. We don't want hitters against our pitchers in general. No, it's just Agreed. negative, negative. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So then we, as, as Sheets is about to watch himself win another tournament in, in the NBA over here, um, we're going to, we're going to loop him back in here because <laughs> so, so about the stacks part of it is, is it really interesting? And this is the, the right way to do it is the way that everyone else does it because mathematically it's the, right oh, we're going to, we're, we're, we're going to have a fight here. All right. I'm wait, ready. Wait, 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 go. wait, hold on. I'm not saying what I, you know, what I do sheets, you know, I know what you do. I, I, my way is not the right way a lot of the time, but if the difference is me going four, two, two or four, three, one, versus five, two or five, five, two, one or five, three, I'm already differentiating myself from the masses of the field. I think that's the right way to play tournaments. I don't think I'm going to necessarily do it as much this year in certain situations, but I still think that you should mix that in and you should certainly mix it in with smaller by smaller entry fields. Um, I think it's the opposite of how most people think it is. They think they should do it more in the larger entry fields. I think it should be in the smaller entry fields when you do it. Because you're already just different. You play the 555 with a thousand people, and you you know you want to win a hundred thousand bucks. Uh, playing one lineup, differentiate that way. And I like what Rody said about using Guriel as an example because th- that's how you get different. If you can get different enough in your five man stack, and you like the guy you're going with, who has a, we'll get into some 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 other terms and isolate is, isolated power. You know, ISO for those of you who play regularly. Um, that's stuff that I, that I look at, but if I can get another guy like that, sometimes let's say Guriel was going to be, let's say he was batting fourth that night and he was 30% on, maybe I'll do the four man stack with the blue Jays and I'll leave Guriel out and I'll play the guy who has the highest ISO versus pitching percentage. And even if he's high owned, people aren't going to have that same mix. And I think there's a lot of opportunities in baseball conversations, but look, overall five, five, whatever you want, one, 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 two, one, five, three, you can't do, I don't know if you, you can do five, three, if you have different pitchers, I guess, but um, that, that is the right way. And on FanDuel, it would be a four, obviously four is the max and you can play a four, two, you have to get three different teams. So you have to do a four, three, one, you can't do a four, four or a four, two, two. All these things are relevant. 
they're much more relevant. The, the correlation between all of these things is much more relevant on FanDuel with a scoring system. On DraftKings, I don't find that it's as necessary when you're counting so much on power. And I've won a lot of six-figure tournaments playing four whatevers. I've also won one, I've also won one or two where I played the five whatevers, but nobody did the four. So that was my way of immediately being different. Four, two, two, four, three, one, four, one, 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 if I want to sometimes. And, and you, you're not really losing that much by doing that, but let's talk about stacking and sort of the general theory, because the right thing is to do if you're going to play 150 is the stack five, two, one, five, five, one, 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 five, three, if you can, or four, two, four, three, one. For, the, for those that really haven't played baseball before, um, explain why that is. Because which, which, which part shoots about stacking in general in baseball. So stacking, because you're, you're betting, it's as much as betting against a team, a pitcher, a situation than it is. It's, it's game conditions. It's, it's weather, it's Colorado, it's, it's course field with the wind blowing out. It's a really bad pitcher with a really bad bullpen. Those are the reasons why stacking is really advantageous. And when you have the possibility of like position players coming in, in the seventh inning, cause you're down by 15, probably a good sign for your team. Um, that's what we're dealing with, like with the Tigers last year and the year before, for that matter. That's the kind of thing we were looking at. So even if they had a decent starting pitcher, you know, once you get past that, you have absolute garbage. And then especially the second half of the year, which is not as relevant early on, teams that are out of it are just going to let the young guys go out there and throw. If they're not throwing well and they can't find the strike zone, you're in trouble. The whole, the whole stack is going to keep going over. You get six, seven at bats. Not to mention that if your guys do well, it correlates to the other guys because you're getting extra at bats. One extra at bat in baseball may not sound like much. It's 20%. Okay. If you have four at bats versus five at bats, that's 20%. It's a huge increase. Like, well, it's 20% on the overall number. It's actually a higher increase. That's, that's part of the reason. The other reason is if you're scoring runs, RBIs, guys on base, pitchers struggle more with guys on base, uh, scoring runs, getting hits with guys on is going to get you extra points. It'll get you more points on FanDuel than it will on DraftKings. The correlation to me, again, doesn't mean as much with the, as long as they keep it as the two for the, for the run, and two for the RBI, you're really just doing it for the other reasons that I mentioned. Um, betting a game situations. Um, there's teams with a the power all throughout their lineup. So that makes some sense that you might get a bad reliever at some point or all that or a couple bad relievers. But overall, there's a, there's a, a ton of reasons why stacking makes sense. And stacking is 100% necessary. It's just a matter of how you choose to stack. On a small slate, maybe you can get away with a 3-3-2 or a 3-2-1-1-1-1. Every now and then there's guys who win with all different players. That is not the way you should be playing DFS baseball. Sheets, talk to that, and then uh, we'll do, Rody jump in because I know he's got some thoughts. Yeah, so the, there's, there's really two, two parts about spat, stacking, and there's one part that, that people forget, and there's one part that, 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 that's obvious. The obvious part is the one that Bobby spent the least amount of time on, which is really interesting because very few people really consider – what Bobby was saying for the majority of it, which is really important. The idea that when you're stacking, you're, you're in a way, yeah, you're betting on the hitting, but you're really just targeting the pitcher. And, and the idea is that if the pitcher is sucking, like he'll be sucking against everybody. You know, if he's throwing up meatballs, he's throwing up meatballs, right? That, and, and that's like the, the less uh, quantitative way of looking at it. The quantitative way of looking at it is looking just from correlation perspective. Like if you, like hockey, if you if, if someone shoots a goal after someone passed to him, they both get points for it. And likewise, if someone gets on base and another guy knocks him in, those kind of points kind of uh, compound because one guy affects the other one. So so the stacking is is twofold. Number one, the mathematical win is yeah, one guy one guy's actions affect the points of another. But yet, I mean, as Bobby pointed out, I mean, you see what happens. You 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 target a pitcher who 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 rates to get get shelled. It's, it's, you're not only targeting the pitcher, but in some cases, we'll get to this later, I guess, you're also targeting the bullpen, you know, because, because if you think it's a, a guy's going to come in, you know, max out of five innings and he stinks. Okay. Th then all you got left, there's like an Oriole bullpen or some bullpen waiting for the, waiting for your hitters to tee off on them also. So, um, yeah, so, so, so that's, that's why stack is important. But one thing I will piggyback off Bobby is, the, the shorter the slate, the less amount of players you need to use in a stack, you know? Uh, I, but the thing is, like, like if you have, look, if you have a 14-game slate, 
I mean, if like if one of the teams rates to score 10 runs, right. And, and you just want that, you know what I mean? Over 14. And, and, but, but if you have a three or four game slate, you know, the, the optimal, or you can win pretty easily with like some two, two threes and three, two twos. And, and, and as, as pure as I am, as usually making those types of, you know, five man stacks, I'm pretty sure that my biggest wins have been when I didn't do it. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so yeah, I pretty much second most of what you said. So no fighting for me. Yeah. And before I jump over to Rody, just in those five man stacks, uh, in general, what we look for when we look for players, we want players who have a high ISO or a player with stolen base upside. My general strategy is obviously if you can get both, then you can spend up for them. If you have a high expensive player who's just on fire to start the season and he's stealing a ton of bases, that is not, and doesn't have any power. That's not a guy who I'm going to spend money on. It's a guy I'll use as a cheap play, but it's a guy who I, I want to, you know, I want to make sure that has the power upside to get me there. Cause one guy with one with five points on DraftKings, which is what a stolen base is worth, or seven points if he gets a walk in the stolen base, it's not enough to get you there. And the odds are, you know, most guys are going to get on base somewhere between 33 and 42% of the time. So just, you know, that that's just something to think about. You want to optimize those at-bats where if the guy gets on, like Acuna is the best example. That's why, you know, I know he's, I don't even know how long he's out, but that's the perfect DFS kind of a player because he has that power speed upside, which is why he costs more than everybody pretty much every night. He also plays in Atlanta, which is a kind of a modern day launching pad. And they used to have one already. Anyways, Rody, jump into that. And then we're going to start talking about some weather conditions because it's going to be really important at the beginning of the year to try and understand the weather. Yeah. Um, just to, uh, you know, go with a little bit more on that, you know, like with stacks and everything, I, I usually stack like five threes a lot. Or like on FanDuel, you do the four three one type. Um, you know, you also got a like batting order. We talked about different people in the batting order, but like e- even though a lot of times if a guy's sitting or something and like a guy moves up and he's like super cheap, you'll get a value play moving in the top. You know, maybe even lead off hit or something. So you know he'll get bumped up in the projections because he he could potentially get that extra bat or whatnot. But you got to remember a lot of that is factored in some projections. Like I, I do use projections a lot more. So some of that, him moving up in the, in the order, get, you know, possible to get an extra bat. Some of the bullpen that the batters would face is also in the projections, even though the pitcher might suck, you know, if he only lasts a few innings, the bullpen's going to be good. It's a bad park. You'll see that reflected in the projections, but also they could be a low owned team. So sometimes you, you might want to grab some of your, you know, single hitters or, you know, your three-man stock, potentially from that, you know, maybe if they got a weak bullpen, even it's a bad park, you can still get a couple homers or something from a weak bullpen. So you kind of got to weigh your ownership a little bit. And I know Bobby doesn't totally go off projections a lot, which is good. So he weighs some of this, watches ownership and, you know, builds unique lineups that way. And it's a good way to get both side view of projections versus not as much projections. So. No, but that's great. And that's, that's, that's sort of a little bit what we have here at True DFS. So that's our thing. Like we're going to, you guys, there's projection-based things. And by the way, both of you guys are projection-based, but you're also very logical game theory people. And you both play that way. And that's why, like, Rody, it won't matter if you're doing that if one of your five or three-man stacks is going to have two guys who are five or less percent owned. True. Yep. It won't matter if your overall stack is less than 7% owned then I'm all in for it. Go for it. That's what you do in those situations. I'm in for that. If I like a stack and it's chalky, and I do believe this toxin brings into another point that's uh, Vegas lines. Uh, yeah, you trust Vegas lines in general. This is not gospel. It's baseball. A lot of random things happen. But in general, the totals are the totals for a reason. There's a game at Wrigley Field with the same pitchers, the same bullpen, the same hitters on the field that could be a six and a half total, that could be an 11 and a half total. And if the wind's blowing in 20 miles an hour from center field, it might be the six and a half. If the wind's blowing out 20 miles an hour to center field and it's 75 degrees, that's a spot where it's probably going to be an 11 and a half total, maybe higher. Um, That's the thing we really should look at. I know it sounds like it sucks. It sounds like an obvious thing. Oh, I learned this before. Yeah, trust Vegas lines to some extent with that. And that's also going to lead me into this weather thing. Well, be really before, before, to... before you, before you head into weather, yeah, let, let, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me talk about something along the lines of stacks and construction for a second, because this is something that you taught me right from the beginning. And, and I think it makes sense when you start talking about project, projections, if you're not careful and you use projections only and you run optimizers and you, and even if you set it for, you know, 
four man stacks, five man stacks. You set it to correlate well. Okay. What you're going to end up getting, and believe I've, I've done this zillions of times. I, I'm a projection junkie. I see all how all this works. You end up getting good looking five man stacks. And then you end up with three one offs that, that are like 2K outfield. You know what I mean? Like 2K guys that are just never going to do anything. Okay. Let's just put it. I use Lewis Brinson as the example, even though he made you a fortune and sometimes he has power. The, 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 it's really important to know what types of one-offs you need as opposed to what types of guys can fit into stacks. Bobby, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a really good point too. Like let's, let's use that example too, as, as it comes into stacks, because first of all, you can get different in stacks by within, within even popular stacks by doing things like skipping the obvious spots, the three and the four, go one, three, five, six, seven, or something like that. That's one thing. The other thing is, if Lewis Brinson is, even if he's in the stack that's popular, let's just say the Marlins were popular that night and they're playing in Colorado. If he's batting seventh, he's going to be 3% owned. And let's just say, argue, for argument's sake, this is probably pretty accurate too. And if he's batting first, probably 30, 25 to 30% owned, even in big buy-ins. Now, while you, you have, yes, a 60 plus percent, 66% chance of getting that one extra at bat, if you're stacking that team, is that one extra at bat going to matter that much? Whereas if that guy's a one-off, that matters immensely. At the same time, I'm always going to side with ownership on that stuff. And occasionally it's going to cost me. I might miss the guy who hit two home runs that night, but I'll take the guy, the other guys who hit the guys who hit 30 home runs, like the Miguel Sano versus Nelson Cruz last year, when Miguel Sano is 4% owned and Nelson Cruz is 30% owned as part of a stack. Those are just spots where, yeah, maybe you do want to include your, some Nelson Cruz but you want to be at 15% in those situations and and then only in stacks. Like you don't want, like, this is just like golfers. If a golfer is 30% owned in general, you're just going to naturally gravitate away from that because you should, it's, it's high variance game that you have extremely high and extremely low floors, high, high ceilings and very low floors. And it's something that you need to try to figure out how you're going to stack in the most logical way, you, you know, the guys who walk and score two runs, they walk twice, like a Jed Lowry, for example, I, I leave him off of my A stack sometimes at the same time, he also correlates better to the A's going off because it's him getting those walks and maybe he ekes his way into 10 fantasy points and maybe it's a home run that one night, even though he does, does it six times a year. So I try to stay away from those guys in my stacks. I try to stay away from the guys with the power and I try to do a lot more wraparound stacks that don't necessarily correlate on FanDuel. Uh, it's on DraftKings. On FanDuel, I want guys in similar orders, at least at some one gappers, nothing. I don't want a one, four, seven as a three man stack. It's not a logical way to do it on FanDuel because you get so much of a boost for the point differential. And if any of you guys want point different, you know what, the, what that is. I'm sure that most of you are experienced enough who are watching this to know. But if you aren't, I'm happy to provide that. It's very simple, but you get basically an extra 60% of those points for RBIs and an extra 45% of those points or 40, 40 ish percent of those points on uh, run scored than you do on DraftKings. So to me, it's more, much more logical to make four man stacks on FanDuel. Anyway, that's, that's this sort of like a, a general stacking thing. I do want to talk about the weather a little bit because early in the season, especially like Wrigley field is a great hitters park in certain conditions. You know what I mean? There's a lot of parks like this. Wrigley Field is probably the most extreme example where it can be a horrible hitters park or it can be like the best hitters park. Like Cleveland, Minnesota, these ones when they're hot, yeah, they're all they're all much better. Uh, Cincinnati, but those are those are decent enough hitters parks anyway. Wrigley Field with the wind blowing in at 20 miles an hour in cold weather, you're going to get crazy crazy, you know, nothing. You're just, nobody's going to play that. I'm not saying you should play it. I don't think you should go for these extreme, oh, I'll take the lowest own because no one thinks this and no one thinks that. So you, what, you know what happens in that kind of weather with 20 miles an hour going in, which happens all the time in Chicago. It'll happen 30 times this year, probably. You get a bunch of singles at best. And if you want to score a bunch of runs, that's how you're going to do it. You're not going to win any tournaments with a bunch of singles. You need some power in your bats. Um, anyway, the, the point is that you want to pay attention to the weather, how hot it is in Texas. Um, if the roof is open in Texas, Arizona, I, I wish it was the old Texas because it was much easier for me to talk about it then because it was just such a hitter's paradise. Now it's a hitter's nightmare when the, when the roof's closed or when it's cold out. Um, 
they're trying to make things to make it a little bit more even in all these parks, but obviously Coors Field being the number one example of this. Um, there's nothing like getting a stack in at Coors Field. And the weirdest part is you can get low owned stacks and then you just have to trust that you, somehow a good pitcher blows up. That's the only time you can do it. You, you're never going to get low owned enough stacks in, in Coors as your primary stack on a full slate. Um, it's just never going to happen when the weather is reasonable. If it's freezing and there's weather concerns and all that and, uh, you know, whatever, but maybe you can get something. But in general, you're not going to ever get that. You want to take advantage of these incredible hitting conditions. It makes a huge difference. If the ball travels 15 to 20 feet longer, sometimes as high as 30 or 40 feet longer, that is a game changer. A fly ball becomes a home run. That's, this is a real important thing that you should look at. And it's, not just the weather because it'll be baked into the Vegas lines, but look at those things. Those are really, really important. And early in the season, Wrigley Field is not going to be a great hitter's park usually. By the time midsummer comes around and it's 100 degrees in Chicago, um, it's, uh, the, it's as good as it gets. It's basically like playing at Coors Field, just with a different reputation because Coors Field is always that profitable. You want to attack certain stadiums. You want to attack certain weather environments. Coors Field and Wrigley, depending on, you want to take the pitchers when they're, when it's the other way, but in general, you want to attack these environments. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me yeah, challenge no, no, you. Already talk on it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, let me just challenge you with this. And this is, the, this is, again, this is, this is great that we're doing this. It reminds me of the conversations that I had with Bobby when I was first learning how to play because I still have the same question, right? So Coors is, you know, a great hitter's part. Wrigley is a great hitter's park when wind blowing out and a great pitcher's park when, when, when wind blowing in. My question is, is, is that fact over-owned by the public in general or, or underappreciated by the public in general? It's a great question. I think it's over-owned for people, well, on the side of over-owned when it comes to top players. And I think it's under-owned when it comes to, to lower tournaments. If you're playing a $1 tournament or a $5, you know, 20 max or something like that, or $3, 20 max, whatever it is, those are things people are going to miss. They're going to miss mm -hmm. maybe more so with the, especially with the smaller stake stuff, but I, that's my, that's my personal take on it. Rody, what do you think about how the weather affects things and, and all of that? Cause I, I mean, I, I look, I live in LA the Dodger stadium is a pitcher's park in general. Dodger stadium is an unbelievable hitters park when it's 85 degrees out at 7 30 PM at night with, sorry, I'm not trying to start a political thing, but global warming is a thing and things are changing and the, the temperatures are changing. So we're seeing even more drastic results of this, but like those, these are real things, but none of them are more important than like the Coors and the Chicago things, just because the way the stadiums are built, like San Francisco, it doesn't really matter if it's warmer. Great. In general, that stadium is never going to be a hitters park compared to every other park. Rody, how do you factor in sometimes, you know, the hitting environment for, for your stacks, for your teams, for the guys you're rostering? Yeah. I mean, I know the, like I said earlier, the, the weather's factored in a little bit in the projections, but I also like one of the main things that I have up for baseball season is I look at each game. What's the weather in each game? Like it's one of the things I look at every, every game. I think every day during the show in the fall, we are always talking about weather you know, we're, uh, we've got to wait on weather. we got to see if the storm's coming. We're watching radars and stuff. We're getting weather reports from our guys that we're, we got weather updates on, you know? So yeah, I think it's huge. Sometimes we just say, Hey, I'm scared of that game. I'm going to fade it. I'm going to play this game. And sometimes, you know, it worked out. And sometimes people taking advantage of the low on weather game that might be weather ended up paying out for them. They go off for 14 runs. It was supposed to rain. The rain moved away and you know, the game played well. And, you know, so you just – you got to take your losses when you can, but your wins, I, I think fading weather games um, and stuff like that and then avoiding some of these bad weather, wind blowing in stuff has helped me in my MLB DFS more than trying to target it because it's low owned or something stupid like that. I'd rather uh, let the – whack uh, what, what – what, excuse me, let the weather factor – um be on the good side i want to be on the good side of that so yeah no that makes sense i mean like in general i agree with that being on the that, 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 that it is somewhat baked into the projections but that's going to lead me to like another point that we're going to talk about and we'll stay only you know for another 15 minutes or so guys we're going to be out of here because we you know it's late and we've been doing this and also like we're going to have plenty more of these videos coming but uh one thing i will say is that i don't 
I'm not, you know, it's the wrong thing to do for sites or whatever. I really do trust certain people. And I'm, I'm going to say, I, I, I happen to trust Kevin Roth as a weatherman. He's not always right. Sheets has pointed out that sometimes the Osimo awesome guy was even better at certain, at, more accurate. It's hard to measure these things. He's as good as, as I know. He's a little bit what I base my weather on. So shout out to my former, my former company, RG. But the one thing I can promise you is that everything that I know about weather, you will know about weather when you come with us. Like I'm, I'm going to be giving you all the details. And if, if a roto grinders, which I doubt they would ever have a problem with this, has a problem with it. That's just what's going to happen. I'm just telling you the truth. We're trying to make you better. And that's in baseball, knowing the risk. If there's a 30% chance a game might rain out, but you think there's only a seven game slate and it's by far the best game on the slate. And you think it'll be under owned because people think it's the 60% chance. Uh, those are things to take advantage of. And there's ways to take advantage of weather that also like, oh, this stack is going to be half as owned as it was because it might not play. You're going to just lose all your money if, when it doesn't. But when it does, and I had this happen once with the Colorado San Francisco game, they delayed it two and a half hours in, in, San, in Colorado. And it was the ESPN game back when, I don't even know if regular season baseball is going to be on ESPN, but uh, I'm sure, well, I'm just kidding around. But it was the ESPN game and I just stuck with it and it won me six figures. It won me hundred K plus that night. You know what I mean? I stuck with the whole game stack. Um, and I, just really quickly, before we get into the next thing I want to talk about, I do want to talk about game stacking and that's really weather dependent. So other than weather dependent or two horrible bullpens or teams that have given up and trying new guys who got, who got called up, which is more later season conversation. What else, is there anything else that I'm missing maybe with game stacking that, because people say, oh, game stacking is not a thing. No, it's a thing. Yeah, I, 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 I would like to actually bring something up with respect to game stacking. Um, because it's something I don't think we talked about yet. Um, and maybe we could save it for another video. But I think what's also factors into whether a game is stackable in general, aside from weather, is the umpires. And, 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 and Bobby, you really stepped up your, your umpire game as we got into, we did last season. Yeah. And that's like a really under, um, I would say under projected, but an under analyzed uh, facet of the game, which is extremely important. And anything that's underanalyzed, that's important. That's a good. That's good. You know, that's good for us. That's a good um, theory on like life and any kind of investment you make. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you mean think about it logically. Like if, if the strike zone is just bigger in one game than for somebody else, I mean, like you know, that it just provides us a great environment or a bad environment, depending on what you're talking about, yeah. for both teams. You know what I mean? So, so, so similar to the way a park can be conducive to a, a game stack also an umpire which is not some people don't even know the umpire like when the game starts you know what I mean? right. like, and, and and so what bobby's been doing i think you're, you're probably gonna do it again this year is you would put out a separate sheet with like umpire data not data but just just your overall opinion on whether it's a hitter's umpire or a pitcher's umpire yep yeah absolutely and and it started you know it started way before you know, when I worked for Roto Grinders, they started doing it. We just felt like that, like you said, like you have an underrepresented piece of information that people are factoring in. Now, most of the time, it's not going to matter. But when it matters, it really matters. And when all the things line up, it works out perfectly. You have the right guy. Oh, and you've got the low owned stack. And this guy tends to miss out high and wide. And I do a lot of pitch type data, too. Like, I get really, really weird with this stuff. And, and, and for me, the general rule when you're trying to look at pitch type, first of all, don't overwhelm yourself. Like this is a lot of information overall, but like try to find out like, okay, so you have a guy who throws a ton of sliders against the best slider hitting team in baseball. That seems like a pretty good spot. You know what I mean? You've got a bullpen with two guys whose main pitcher sliders or sliders or something. That's just an example. You know, the twins were an example a few years back. For some reason, everybody thought Miguel Sano was like just a fastball hitter. And this guy was hitting changeups like at a rate, like, with power nobody had ever seen because he strikes out on every fastball and he hits a home run on every changeup. When you have a changeup heavy pitcher, they're going to go in throwing their pitch. These are little edges you can get. I know I sort of deviated from the original point about the umpire data, but I do think umpire data is relevant. Rody, does it affect you? And I know it affects, it doesn't affect the projections as much, but I know that you follow a lot of the people that I do. And I'm going to give another shout out to my old, uh, my old work associate who we work together all the time. We yell at each other many times. We got along great. Uh, Derek Cardi, but, uh, I do think his projection system is awesome and he does a really good job with umpire data. 
and also stadium umpire data. Like for example, certain stadiums that are good hitters parks lead to more strikeouts and people go, well, how can that be? How does it happen in a stadium? They lead to more strikeouts. Maybe it's the, uh, the, the, the amount of fans in the stadium, maybe all this, but the most important thing is the backdrop behind the pitcher's arm, because these guys are at such an elite level. This is my take that you're watching the ball come out of someone's hand. And when it, the Colorado even changed it, they used to have just a giant green screen. They still do, but they've got a lot more room between it now. And they've got little trees and stuff around it. It used to be the easiest uh, place in baseball to pick up the ball too, which added to all of the inflated numbers in Colorado. Rody, how do you, how do you use umpire data? And does any of this stuff, you know, make sense with you? Yeah, everything you uh, said makes sense. Um, I know Derek Cardi does have a nice little section in there factored in um, some stuff like that. You can see, you know, the ranking of the umpire for that game or, you know, so yeah, I mean, I usually just use it in the projections a little bit. And then like with the shows with uh, doing with you this year or last year, um, I was uh, using that from what you were telling me too and the list that you were coming up with. So um, it, yeah, it, it factors in a lot, you know, it definitely worked out last year. I think a lot of us were targeting, you know, good pitchers, umpires, and that, that helped us out when we we're picking our pitchers and getting a low owned guy in a good pitching uh, environment. I think that would, that would help us take us to the top having that, that elite pitcher for the night. So I think it, it worked out a, a lot more than it didn't. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, again, about 10 more minutes, guys, uh, Rody, I'm going to start with you on, on this thing. So you're looking at projections in general, uh, like more than I do. So we're, we're good, like sort of like counterpoints and Sheets and I, we talk a lot more. So even though he does the same, maybe, maybe it's not quite the same, you know, for the, for the viewers that are, that are out there. Some stats that matter to me, I'm just going to start off with other than projections are things like isolated power, uh, strikeouts per nine innings, strikeouts per, uh, per batter, things things that are like that. Uh, you can use fangraphs.com. Again, our job is not to be the best site at giving you every piece of information. We're trying to help you be a better DFS player. This is what we're doing. And these are the things that I'm looking at that is all encompassed in the, the information we're giving you through SaberSim and all this stuff. But that's that that's the way that's the way I do it. I look at isolated power as the God, as the most important thing. And I love anybody with power and speed upside because you have a bunch of outs. If you're playing cash games, it's the obvious thing to do, but you cram those guys in because they're, they're going to get you some points almost all the time. Not always, but um, how do you, how do you, what, what are some stats that matter? Are there anything that we're missing? You know, strikeouts per nine, uh, strikeouts per at bat. Are there, you know, isolated power, stolen base percentage? How many times the pitcher's given up a stolen base? Is there anything you look at like that or do you base it more on projections? I don't like to key in on one thing. I, I think like um, like you, you you might just talked about some of the key things. I think those matter, but I, I, I like looking at a lot more of the raw numbers, I think, because it's all baked into it more. So I think that's what Sheets' approach is probably going to be the same. I don't think he individually out. I think I look at it as all of them in a whole, in one whole for that guy for that day. You know, and they change by, you know, park factors, weather factors, umpire factors. So, you know, yeah, we can look at those individually and break them out. But if you guys want to build lineups fast and kind of our motto is, hey, don't factor in all these things. Bobby's going to tell me the guys at the end of the day when I get on the live videos, when I'm checking out the plays, when I'm looking at roadie stacks or, or pitcher values of the night. These are going to come from the things and the research that we're doing and coming from these data that we're getting. So you guys don't have to do that. So when you're grabbing and uploading Saber Sim and, okay, these guys are the top. Uh, Rody's core is this. He's going to lock these guys in. And then you're building lineups with that. That gives you guys the content that you need to build lineups fast and don't have to spend three to four hours looking at all these different metrics. And, and then you can build your lineups fast. You're getting good lineups putting out there. You're becoming a better DFS player. And that's kind of how I've always built my lineups. I don't want to factor in all these tons of things when they're already baked in the projections kind of, and I use the projections and um, I just try to manipulate them and put the pieces together. Basically they're a bunch of puzzle pieces and I put them together the best way I can to build a lineup. And then hopefully it works out on the end of the night. So Yep. I, I don't have any specifics that I would. No, but I, but I, but I, I it's really good. It's a really, it's the, the point that I want everyone to take away from this. Don't worry about it. You'll hear me say it. You'll see me write about it. You'll see it in my picks. I'm going to figure this stuff out the best way I can. And I'm going to do the best I can. And I don't want to toot anyone's horn, but we are three guys who 
don't play max entry everything. We don't bet, you know, $15,000 a night or a hundred thousand dollars a night or whatever people play or a million on the NFL weekend, but we give you a chance to win a big tournament. And I used to tell people this when I was coaching, I'm not saying you're going to win one right away. And that's another really important point. Like in baseball, you're going to lose like in every sport, you're going to lose. If you're a good tournament player, you should lose most days and win big when you win. That's the way it should work. I, in my opinion, there's no way of d d disputing that. Sheets, take what Rody said, and then you know maybe. Yeah, maybe I, I, I have, I have, I have. I know you were on a time limit. I, I got a lot to say about this though. So, so no, 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 I'm not on time limit. Okay, so, so with with respect to baseball projections, all right. So, ISO and 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 strikeouts per nine and all that stuff. All those are data points which all the models use to come up with their projections anyway. Okay, so so, so when, when you ask me which of those things are most important to you, I honestly, you know, don't put one of them as that important. I just say, okay, the people that make the projections sort of know what they're doing and they, you know, as much as they weight them, then I just kind of accept that. Okay, now. The thing is, and this is one of the reasons why projections are kind of fragile in baseball, is that baseball, as long as it's been a sport, has been the most numbers-based sport in all of sports, okay? Like, everybody knows, for example, you know, Babe Ruth 714 home runs, you know, Hank Aaron 755, you know, all those key stats and numbers, everybody knows, we're supposed to. Anybody idea, have any idea how many yards Walter Payton ran for? No. You know what I mean? Baseball has always been, had that love of stats and numbers and things like that. So as we've gotten into the new era of stats, the baseball statistics have gotten so arcane and so many million derivatives of different types of stats that I, I worry that the projection models are just going bananas trying to make heads or tails of it and maybe overweighting things more than they should, and maybe double counting things. But nonetheless, I do not regard one particular thing as more important than another when it gets to a projection. But what I will say is this, do not be that person that double counts. In other words, don't be the person that says, boy, oh boy, Max Scherzer is a re projects really well. And you know what? He's got high strikeout upside. Well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why he projects well. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, the the the, the Rockies, they they project to be a really good stack. And you know what else? They're in a real good park situation. Well, yeah. I mean, so so don't double count it. Now, however, I'm gonna agree with you, Bobby, as well, is that if you believe that strikeouts per nine is something that is just that much more important than other things, then you can be super sharp and you can look at projections. And then say, okay, you have two guys with equal projections, but one guy has a higher strikeout per nine that went to that projection. And the other guy just has like more innings and more soft contact and things like that. And it goes back to what type of guy you want. We didn't really talk about pitchers to the extent that we should have. We may. Well, well, this, is, well, this is one video of three, you know? Right. Well, no, but my point is, is that the pitchers that you want, you could have two equally median projected pitchers and one of them has all the strikeout upside. And the other guy is like, you know, the, um, like the Max Freed, you know what I mean? Like the guy that's just going to get everybody great. out. Yeah. Great. You know what I mean? And, and yes, there are some slates where you want to play somebody with Max Freed, you know what I mean? But, but in general, you want the pitchers with the high strikeout upside and you'll, if you just rely on projections and I, I this happens to me all the time. I end up with so many pitchers if when I just use the projections that are just like Max Freed, Dallas Keiko pairings. You're like all day long because right. they'll throw soft contact. They'll they'll put up 15 fantasy. They'll project for 15 fantasy points. They'll be 5K, right. you know, and I'm like, oh, I want that, you know, right. but I don't. <laughs> so, right. so. But, it, but you know, it's funny because in, it, it's a great – Max Fried is probably the best example because he's probably the most elite pitcher with the lowest strikeout rate. Um, but that's a really good example of a guy who – the time to play him is when no one is going to play him and he's facing a team that strikes out at a 26% clip, and that happens. 
You know what I mean? In the modern day baseball, that happens. You get a few weird guys in the lineup. All of a sudden, those soft ground balls are strikeouts. You know what I mean? Yep. And those three strikeouts might determine whether you win or lose a tournament. By the way, Walter Payton, the biggest, mis- you know, ran for 852 yards was his highest year. I actually happen to know that because I loved Walter Payton when I was younger. Wait, what'd you say? He ran for, you said Walter Payton. Nobody knows how many yards you yeah. ran for. So I was going to say, I ran for, I know his high, I know his career total is 1852. Okay. That was because it was an old, it was like an old thing. I was just sort of a throwback to what you were saying before. Um, but I, I, I do think that uh, playing those, like you take those kind of pitchers and you genuinely want to get them out of your lineups. Now, when they're going to be weirdly low owned on a kind of a confusing slate and they've got a high strikeout probability against them and we're going to end on this, don't you think it's worth it to, to gamble on these guys that they're six, 0.5 per nine or seven per nine, I guess in Max Freed's case, turn into like nine or 10 because those extra five and a half or 7.25 or whatever site you're, uh, five and a half or 8.25, excuse me, on DraftKings or on FanDuel where it's four for every strikeout. So it does 12 points versus three points. Those nine point differences, like they can win you tournaments. And I, that's, my, that's my advice on how to treat those sort of pitchers that have that median result. But in general, you want to try to get it out of your head to play these people. Like they should be used for specialty situations only or like small slates, like um, a slate where you think there's a a ton of chalk on the high end pitchers, but they're both pitching ones in Coors and ones in Wrigley with the wind blowing out. Like that's the kind of time when you can utilize these guys. But mostly we we do want the strikeouts, right Sheets? And then I'm going to turn it over to Rody. The name of the game the, with the way the numbers are organized, it's not true for real baseball. There's a lot of guys who think a lot of guys who are great pitchers are not great pitchers in DFS and, and in real life. There's a lot of guys who think that guys who are great pitchers in real life who are terrible for DFS. But does it, it, you want the strikeouts. You want the high range of results. I want the guy who's, you know, in, in golf, I want the guy who's going for it in two every time on a par five. I don't want the guy who I know is going to lay up to try and set himself up for a shot, unless his name is probably Justin Thomas or Colin Morikawa. But in general, I want the guys who are going for it. And the same thing with the pitchers. You want the you want the high rate. You want the high risk, in my opinion, because that's one thing people don't focus on. And then you can play your chalky sacks if they're good. And you want the you really want that upside. You want to have the guy who can even not get through his four and two thirds innings, like the guy for the Marlins last year, and all of these guys we've seen, all these young guys but they might strike out nine or 10 guys. You know what I mean? Because no one's seen them before. Um, that's another big thing. No one's seen them before is a big thing. If there's a high, high level prospect and he's only going to throw 80 pitches, doesn't mean you should cross them off, but you shouldn't play him at chalk. You know what I mean? How, how do we approach those kind of things, Rody? And sort of what are your thoughts on everything Sheets was saying before? Yeah, I'll piggyback to that. Um, you know, some of these projection models now have, you know, player props and betting lines incorporated into them as well, you know, like strikeout player props, you know, so, you know, I tend to see that I tend to see the betting lines, you know, and what these players are, are going to do. So I, I tend to, I mean, that's factored in, so I don't look at that, but you know, you, you can sometimes like we talk about on a show, like, Hey, this guy's strikeout prop just got bumped up, you know, and that might not be something a lot of these guys see. It could have changed recently before lock or after lock even. And, you know, you want to jam a pitcher in now or something or get more exposure to that guy. And, you know, the, you know, the lines are on that team more, you know, so just kind of seeing that in the projections and, you know, having that built into everything and just kind of watching it a little bit more than I I would. Mm -hmm. Um, So Absolutely. You know, that might be newer than I know he was talking about, you know, a lot of them are really good projections. They're, they're kind of getting the same. They might overweight things, but there's still a lot of new things come into the game, you know, with, with more, more accurate props and more, more like you, you're into the Vegas, the betting lines and, you know, getting, nailing that down and being a little differentiation than just regular stats from baseball that mm-hmm. can help, help give you that extra boost to get a guy that you want in your lineup. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the final thing we're going to end on really quickly is just going to be very briefly. I know Rody doesn't likes the five, three and the, and the stacks and it makes sense. And it's, and look, it works. Nothing is, there's a many, there's many ways to skin a cat. I don't even like that extra. I don't even understand what that comes from, but there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. And this is one of them. They're different. You know what I mean? 
I do look for occasional one-offs that I feel like are being overlooked and I'll look for them in every spot in the lineup because you catch that weird two home run spot from the, the six hitter for a team that you didn't expect, but because sometimes you could say BVP, sometimes you could say pitch type versus whatever isolated power versus the opposite hand. Is there any, and I'm going to start with sheets because I think I know Rody's answer on this one. Is there any weight that you give into any of this stuff? Or are you going more on projections? What do you mean? Like the. Like a guy who's left-handed, who tends to give up, you know, has a, whatever, a 9% home run rate versus lefties when he's throwing. Yeah. I, I, I unfortunately, I'm in the, uh, I'm kind of in the Cardi camp on this. I just don't think there's, I I really, okay. I really don't think there's enough samples. I can actually statistically measure, measure the, the arm angle. Yeah. He even agrees that lefty righty and, he just thinks lefty righty is always better. He doesn't believe anybody of the same hand could ever be better. Oh, oh, I was just saying like the lefty masher theory and things like that, you know, like the, oh, the yeah. Wilbur Flores uh, or whatever. Uh, but, but I, 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 I believe that given what I I've said about baseball and about variance and like all this stuff, I think that a lot of the, um, I think that, that there's, <laughs> there's a lot of stats being thrown out that have just not been tested by sample size enough to, to make it work. If somebody tells me they're five for 15 against the pitcher, I'm, I'm really just not interested. You know what I mean? Like, like, if you, and I don't know what the number is that makes it relevant, but I, I, I do think that, that I, I shouldn't say that people overestimate that. Cause I still, I still think the sharpest players will, will don't really get, get, get hooked up in that. I agree with you, which is the only time I can get the lower own, in my opinion, interestingly right. good plays against the guy. Like, look, if you have a great fastball, uh, whatever you want to call what Garrett Cole's other pitches, what do you want to call it a slider, a changeup, whatever you want to call that secondary pitch. But when you get a guy who's like that, like Rowdy Tellez is against him, what is he, nine for 19 with like five home runs, you know? If, if everything matches up, then I can find ways to make sense of the isolation play. Also, you've got minimum cost guys, so you're not really risking that much because no one's playing anybody against the pitcher. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, that, that's when I'm, I'm more tended to do it. Rody, do you ever take any of this stuff into consideration? Are you still baking into the projections, but also knowing that you have an edge with your projections because you can take a different projected team, like the Dodgers are projected to score five runs or whatever the night, as opposed to six and a half like they are every other night, the night you, you took them. Is there, is there anything like that? Or are you going more with the, the numbers? I think I know the answer. Yeah, I'd go with more of the numbers. I, I mean, I'm more of a trust the projections guy, you know, on that stuff and really, really just trust the projections that I, I have. So, well, in all fairness, uh, my brief, my brief experience with Saber Sim has been nothing but leading me to the right projections. Uh, I know that sheets. Well, when he waits well, the- well, you wait, you wait, you wait, you <laughs> You wait till you see what the kind of crap that spews out for baseball. Hey, it spewed it out for basketball. You know what it spewed out? Lance Stevenson. You know what he did? He got <laughs> three, four fantasy points. And by the way, I like yeah. him too. And yeah, no, but you, 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 wait, you wait till you, you with baseball, you, you'll look at the projection. You say, okay, um, Colorado rates to be the number one stack. Dodgers rate to be the second the second stack. Yankees look third. Here's you the Marlins. 50 lineup. Wait, you have 50 lineups. We'll have 40% San Francisco. I mean, I'm telling you, it happens. Like all, and they're always 2% owned. It's, yeah, it's it ends up 40% San Francisco and 40% the Marlins. It's sick. <laughs> it's really, do you know how many times, remember, I was, I was at the Marlins last year? I, I remember. I remember. No, because it, it leads you to it. And this is what's great about what we're trying to offer. Like, we have different perspectives. We actually come to the same conclusion a lot, but we actually come, we come to very different conclusions every now and then. And sometimes, you know, Sheets and Rody's opinion weighs on me, and sometimes mine. I hey, think- let me let me. Uh, you know what? While we have him here, okay, I, I want to ask this. So, so, so we're, we're we're all kind of different players with respect to what we play. I mean, I've I've, I've become since since we all three started doing this. I mean, I've I've kind of up my buy-in levels a little bit since last time. Like we all got to. Do baseball, whatever. How'd that work out? Road. How'd that work out for you? Yeah, well, right. Yeah. Well, because I don't need. Well, I don't need to beat seven thousand people to win. You exactly. know I mean? like, it's a lot so, 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 my, the reason I bring it up is that Rody plays like my, my, you know, much bigger, and and so, so Rody's approach can be a little different because he doesn't have to beat seven thousand people. That's true. Rody, tell, tell, 
why don't you say like some of the things that you play? I mean, are you still going to be playing like the the sad? You, you play the I was about to say the single man's the single table sad. I was about to call it the sit and go. But uh, but are you still going to be playing like the uh, like the ten man satellites and, and stuff like that? Like what are you what are you planning on playing this year in baseball? Oh, that's a good question. I'll see what they got out. I mean, I, yeah. I like the live finals. I probably won't play as big as buy-in for those live finals. As it eats a lot of your bankroll. Yeah, really. and, and, you know, you can you can lose a lot of money just trying to go for those big tickets. But I've had a really good time on these trips. I enjoy the DraftKings and FanDuel trips that I've went on. Um, you know, I just I just came back from Nashville for the NBA Live for the uh, DraftKings basketball one. That was really fun. I definitely going to try to grab a few of them. I do I go for a lot of tickets on the night. Those 10 man, you know, you guys see me screenshot these little 10 man yeah. ones where I'm going against McLovin, Petty Theft, every top guy in the industry. And it's not easy because every lineup that's in there is a really good lineup. Maybe it's a, can I throw, can I, can I point a thing in this and why I think you have some edge? This is not necessarily their number one lineup. This is their number one lineup strategy for that tournament entry. So I kind of like those big buy in things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Isn't there a strategy to that as well? Like you, yeah, I don't know. I thought, I th- Bobby, is that true? Because I was always under the impression that, that these guys just put the same lineup in all those things. Oh, they put them in a bunch of different things. I mean, look, McLovin, I, we, I hung out with the guy uh, a couple times. It seems like a great dude. Um, he He's, he's great chalky. In the, well, yeah, in those. You use a lot of optimizer, like just straight optimizer. He's going to be chalky. He's also going to have like five plays that are like, a half a percent owned or less yeah, real, like in yeah. his, in his bigger buy, it, it, not necessarily the bigger buy-ins, but like the bigger field tournaments, 10 man tournament, they're going to play basically what you would equate, equate, equate to a cash game lineup and yeah. it'll work for them a good percentage of the time. All it has to do is work for them one out of every three or four times. And they're right. They don't need to win every one of them. So yeah. p- battling against them is great. And in some sense, cause it's not like you're playing them heads up in poker, you know, taking mine and sheets background you're playing them knowing kind of what they're going to do a little bit. Is there any, anything with that? It's not really baseball related. It's more general strategy related. Yeah. I really like where you're going with that. I've actually talked to a few sharper guys as I've been on these trips and other guys that I've met, you know, that I've talked to now personally, I have their phone numbers and we chat. Um, there's a lot of people that actually study the people that are in the contest and know how they play and they will make a lineup based on what they know the guys are going to do. And a lot of these sharper guys have told me that, you know, and so that's kind of interesting. So I have started looking at like, you know, I know McLovin plays a cash optimizer lineup type, but he also going to have, like you said, he's going to have some, he's going to have multiple Weird, lineups. Yeah, in there. Same he's as going to have some really. super low owns. Yeah. And like, and I went to the live final where these guys have five tickets and one of them's the one a combined ownership in the NBA live final was 494%. He paid straight hit optimized, put that but, in. But, but, then, but he, listen, then his winning lineup was a 60% win. But, but listen, so but that's not, they're but that's spreading no it out. Joke, but that's no joke. You know, like uh, when, when you, when you, when, when you, uh, you analogize this to poker roadie. Okay. Now you didn't, you didn't play poker, right? So, 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 so what have, people would have when they played poker, is there was software that kept track of everybody's tendencies and, and and you had stats on every single player that you were going to be, the the good players did had stats on every player they were going up against and the high stakes cash players had in-depth stats on everybody. And, and, and there was one guy I knew who had like a a cell phone app that he created that if a guy with an X amount of, 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 of percentage of certain thing, sat at a table, he would get a notification on his phone saying that you got to come and sit at this table because oh. this guy has 32% XYZ, right? So it's it's sick, right? And and it's, if, it's honestly it, a shame because it ruined poker in my opinion. Right. Exactly. But and it comes and it now now if you if it came to that like in, in DFS where you have a bunch of these like 10 man contests with people playing like 5200 a man, whatever it is, that that's what happens is people can track people's tendencies like and, and even like on a very small level i've been playing you know a lot of different sports and i've been playing tennis a lot uh, as far as your know, dfs goes and there are some times where you start to recognize the same people in the smaller tournaments right and there are times where i'm between two or three lineups and i've noticed that there's one there's two particular guys they always run the roto grinders optimal it, they just always do they run the rotor grind as optimal and they enter it in a single entry every single time, right? So I'll know 
that these two guys are always duped. And I will always just pick a lineup that's a little bit different than theirs, even by like half a point, because I've, I've tracked it. And that's just me eyeballing it. Imagine if software could like actually like alert people to that. I mean, high buy-in stuff is already tough. That would make it impossible. Yeah, absolutely. And and in terms of that, like that's like a 10-man thinking. I'm talking about like, right. you know, we're, we're, we're playing, you know, I played a $3,300 tournament for 100K for first last night right. for a 67-man. And there'll, there'll be opportunities for this in baseball. In baseball, I don't like the proposition as much. Okay. But I would love to play a thirty-three hundred dollars tournament for a million because I think I have a better chance at winning a million mm-hmm. than I do a hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not necessarily, you know what I'm saying? Though it's not that big of a difference because of my natural way of playing has been beat everyone else who's playing more than you are, beat everyone else who has a million chances to get at this, beat everyone else like this. And by the way, these lineups work in single entries. Hashtag sheets just with the with the freaking win tonight. <laughs> There you go. Dude, 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 you know what I love? I love when I win by like 15 points and everybody else is like within one point in second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. <laughs> it's, it's pretty awesome, bro. <laughs> um, but wait, let, let me let me share one bit of advice. Okay, this, so this is like Bob, like listen, Bobby is not like a projection guy, but Bobby's approach to, to GPPs is so freaking off the charts, like good. And, and again, I, I analyze this from a hedge fund perspective, whatever it is, because the stuff that he does is just stuff that that makes sense if you step back and think about it. But he's actually puts it to use. Like, I'll give you one thing that he does, like in baseball, which is to, I call it like the Bobby stack. It's not even a Bobby stack. Look, he look, a lot of people do stuff like, oh, don't play one, two, three, four, five, play one, three, six, seven. So that stuff that Bobby does is like kind of like what other people do. But like when when you have like a, a really chalky stack like Colorado or the Dodgers or whatever. What some people do is just play it. Another people will, uh, will go underweight it or exit out. But what Bobby does is screw that. I'm just going to play like one guy from there right? or like two guys from there. So he gets exposure to it. So he's not like throwing money into garbage, but he's using other stacks around those guys as one offs. And I've just seen it. Work. Oh, I actually appreciate that. Way, I think it's way too often. It's the biggest misconception in sports is that, or in DFS, is that, oh, it's stack or fade for a baseball game. I'm right. like, it's a freaking baseball game. I'll take the elements and everything. And if you can, I just can all have your thing. But I'm going to rotate these group of four, guys, four hitters amongst my lineups. And that's going to be what I do. That's going to be my one-off or my two-off or whatever it is. You don't need to, to, to make these hard and fast rules. Yes, if you're max entering everything, like some of the people who talk about this stuff are, that's a different story. And, and again, I still probably would have a little bit of that attitude, but that's not what we're, we're not selling, but like who we are, like that's what we, I guess selling, but like this is what makes us a good team overall. And it's not a coincidence entirely that like, you know, we do, I don't know, in my opinion, I think we do better together. At least you guys have helped me yeah. out. I can only speak for myself on this one. Actually, I know I, I know me and Cheats have our thing, but like Rody, you know, like one of us is going to win a million dollars this year. It's going to happen. It almost just happened. It, why not? You know? Anyway, but I, I do think that like taking a, a, like a slightly different approach from the general masses because it's the right thing to do when you're only talking about like, you know, between five and 15% leverage at best, like, why are we all doing what they have to do when there's a five to 15 point percent spread when the ownership is slanting 95% one way? Does that make sense, Rody? Yeah, it makes sense. Any final thoughts, Rody, before we get out of here? Because I think that it's probably good for us to call it a night and then like we'll pick it up on, on uh, number two and we'll, we'll start sharing our stuff. We just have certain restrictions we have to like abide by. So this is just us talking. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. But Rody, go ahead. Yeah, this is more like a MLB um, podcast where we're kind of getting everyone back in the groove. So I hope everyone enjoyed the video, just kind of going through, bouncing back all our ideas between all of us. It's good. It's kind of a refresher for me too. you know, talking stats, talking players again, talking numbers like it helps me get ready for the baseball season. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and a lot of big things coming here. And I hope one of us does hit the million dollars very soon as well. And even if we don't, we can win a million shortly, like slowly. You know what I mean? It can, it can last the whole season. If it takes a whole season for me to make a million dollars from baseball, I'll take it. <laughs> She's, I, I, She's wants it right away. I just, dude, I just want to, I just want to win. I want to win. 
You know, I, I just, did. And, and, I just and, want to win. I don't care if it's 5,000, 50,000, or 500,000. I just want to win. Yeah, this is where me and Peach are on different pages, but I absolutely love it and respect it. Uh, you guys are both freaking awesome. I really like what we're doing with the site. Guys, again, please give a like, the thumbs up, check it out. Or give us the thumbs down and tell me why you don't like it. I know it's weird. We're a little different with the way we provide content, but like, this is who we are. Like, we're trying to do everything exactly honestly. We tell you exactly what we're doing. If we could tell you, like, without the sites shutting our site down, what we're doing, me and Cheats would do it up to lock. I promise you that. Yep. We've done it before. <laughs> like, we freaking have done it before. I put one up there that won the monster in the NBA and got in trouble because it won the monster. I'm like, okay, but at the same time, like, you know, you win 25,000 bucks off of 500 bucks, like, it's a good sign. Anyway, we're gonna be better, we, we're gonna be better and we're gonna be, not better, I'll be better. We'll be back for more baseball. Uh, we're gonna keep this going. It's, it, this is like our first draft of our intro, so just keep that in mind. And uh, Sheets, any final thoughts? Uh, no. Congratulations, Sheets, for the win. Brody, any final Well, yeah, well, you know, um, this is going to stay up there, whatever. There, there, there's, there's a very, it's at least a 10% chance of, of a legit hockey sweat. Oh, my many, God. This is how many different screenshots are you going to put in there It's like I'm sitting here stressing over all of my stuff because all I'm trying to do is. Here, I'll show you. Here, I'll show you. I'll share. Oh, you just, you just disabled screen share. No, I didn't. No, I didn't hear it. Here, go, go, go. go. Yeah, so this is. So this like is a, um, a little hockey at the end. It's not natural for the. So day. we're in 18th place. Okay. We got one period left. We got 51. Oh, you got a lot of time. We got 51 left. And we're like only like 20. And like no one's got shit pretty much left. I'm going to need like a goal or like a goal and a half in like the last period or something. It's not easy. It's a tough sweat. Cause you just got to wait, wait, just hope you get that goal. But if you get a goal, like it, I go past like literally like everybody. <laughs> so it's, so it's, let's, it's, let's freaking go. Let's get and it. And that, and that dude, that's 20,000 for first. And that, this that would be all by myself. Sweats. People are like, how can you sleep? I fell asleep one night. Cause I, and I won a hundred thousand. I woke up in the morning and I was like, Oh, cool. It's amazing. I won 100000 on a $33 Dude, tournament. And you, and you see this ownership? This is what oh, just you guys want to Oh, my plug. God. You guys want to plug for Sabersim? This yeah. is what, like, all of the hockey lineups look like. <laughs> like every, yeah, guys, every, I seriously suggest, like, like every get, one of them. For us, like, I, I really think this is, like, an unbelievable product. Do we, do we got a good, I got a 2% own goalie <laughs> smash. It, 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 it's solving a lot of my brain problems. <laughs> it's incredible, man. Like, you, you, you get this stuff, like, I mean, that's, a, that's the most ridiculous lineup I've ever seen in my life, actually. Like, and that, that's I'm somebody that something's now I'm in like 20 first. Your like, high owned rough, seven, but... Your high own 7.9% guy. Yeah, exactly. He's my chalk. He's my chalk. Crazy. He's my chalk. All right. Well, let's freaking go, Sheets. He already won the NBA one and may as well win the NHL as he does so often. And by the way, if you don't check out his sheets with the, the Sabersim product, I swear, I'm not going to say this very often, but you're doing something wrong. Well, I'm well, hold on. Let's, re let's, 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 let's really, uh, listen, let's really call it what it is. It's to, to win at this. I mean, at least for me, it's like a combination of, of, and, and, you know, you, you can wait them however you want, but projections to start a, a good, like lineup builder, you know, then a little gut instinct. And then the most important thing is to interlay all of the, incredible like fundamental takes that I steal from Bobby and DFS Chan and like the other guys like on the site. Um, so you guys can do the same. <laughs> um, and I that's, that's, it. it's, it's all a big combination of all of that. I appreciate it, man. And I think that you're going to have a, a chance here. Rody, any final thoughts before we get out of here and we're going to continue this baseball conversation again soon. So. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm good. I think we talked a lot of stuff. It's a good refresher. And uh, as always, let's get it. And guys, let us know in the in our in our uh, Discord channel whether or not we didn't cover things you want to talk about. Uh, Drew DFS support. Let's get into all of it. I'm happy to. We want to make this the easiest, best experience for you guys, and we most importantly, we want to make you better at this and enjoy yourself while doing it. So let's do it all together. And uh, this is part one. We will see you guys soon. Good luck, everybody. As Rody, Rody, I'm gonna let you finish this one off. Let's get it.